All right. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Shweta Arya. I'm the Outreach Director for Delaware Interfaith Power and Light. We are very glad that you took out this time from your precious evening. I know we all are Zoomed out and we go to a lot of these Zoom meetings and webinars all day. So, you know, we really appreciate you taking out time for, for this webinar tonight. Um, we started this webinar series um, around the same time last year. And this is just a way for us to um, bring some um, really knowledgeable speakers to you um, and have a candid conversation on, on climate solutions and climate related topics. And let's see if I can move to the next slide. Ah, I always do this. All right, we'll start with some housekeeping rules. So if you want to have the best um, you know, view, uh, you can go on the top right corner and click the speaker view um, so you can see our presenters um, when they're speaking. And uh, for the time of the presentation, if you can just please mute yourself, that'll be great. If you have any questions, you can put it in the chat box. Um, some of you are new, so I will just spend a few minutes here um, just sharing um, of, you know, basics about our organization and our mission. Delaware Interfaith Power and Light, we are one of the 40 state affiliates of National Interfaith Power and Light. And our shared mission is to inspire and mobilize people of faith and you know, our community partners to take a bold and just action on the biggest crisis we are facing today, you know, climate change, to scientifically inform and spiritually deepen our relationship with the natural world and provide a religious response to climate change. We really believe um, you know, it is our moral ob obligation to act on climate change and you know, there is a sense of urgency to act on it. So, um, you know, we work with our faith communities and these are the three pillars through which we work with our faith communities. We really want our, our houses of faith, interfaith groups to be models of sustainability. So we want to encourage, you know, we work with faith leaders and faith communities and encourage them to be um, really uh, first utilize our programs to reduce their own carbon footprint and then educate the community at large uh, to do the same. So we have programs in place like, you know, practical programs like energy audits. So we help houses of, you know, houses of faith to um, do an energy audit until June. Uh, you can actually get an energy audit for no cost at all. Usually they run in between $2,000 and $3,000. And right now you can really do it at no cost you know, put solar panels. So we provide um, resources to our houses of faith, um, you know, to, to reduce their carbon footprint. We do educational and outreach events like, you know, putting up these webinars and speaker events um, to create awareness about climate change. And last but not least, we advocate for clean energy policies. Um, you know, we, we really ask our elected leaders to uh, take climate change seriously, and we work on that. So if you're interested in any of these programs, please reach out to us. A quick poll. So I actually put this as a reminder to myself so I can ask, a, you know, take a quick poll. Let me see if I can launch that. Sometimes I have it. It's just Lisa, can you uh, are you able to launch that poll? Yes. Okay, can you do that for me, please? Thanks. Can you see it?
um, I don't see it and I, I'm able to launch it now. Right. Well, I've already got it launched. You can't see it because you're the host. Okay. I found that Let's out see. last time. So we're getting up there. 70% uh, voting. So almost there. We're about oh. to close it. So I'll have to tell you what the. Uh... Okay. All right. I'm going to end the poll. All right. So the answer is. Um, so dismissive, we have 0%. Doubtful, we have 0 <laughs> Lisa, did you um, publish the results? Oh, there we go. Okay. Everybody see that? So we've got 0% for dismissive, doubtful, disengaged, or cautious. Everybody is in the concerned and alarmed, and 83% are alarmed. Wow. All right, so we don't have to convince this group of people. <laughs> okay, I better change so, my presentation. Okay, well, that's good to know. Um, okay, so I'll quickly go over the agenda overview. Um, you know, COVID and climate, I mean, it's such an important topic. I think we all have gone through a lot with COVID since last year. Um, although it has been really tough, there has been some <laughs> silver lining to it. You know, we've really learned some good lessons through COVID and um, let's discuss how can we apply that to another cri crisis, a bigger crisis that we are facing with climate change. Um, I'm going to now uh, introduce our speakers. Um, and this is, this is how we will go is um, our first speaker is going to be Lisa Locke. She's uh, Director of Programs at Deliver Integrate Power and Light. Um, Lisa oversees and implements programs for the IPL. Previously, she served as the director, she moved to the coast in 2013. Lisa lived in West Michigan, an area rich in both natural resources and collaborative partnerships to protect them. She served as um, administrator for West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum project manager with Sustainable Research Group and associate director of West Michigan Environmental Action Council. So uh, Lisa is going to be our first speaker, but I'll go ahead and introduce all our speakers and then I will give it to you, Lisa. Okay. Uh, our next speaker would be Dr. Alan Greenglass. Uh, he's a retired uh, physician. Um, he's also uh, a board member of Physicians for Social Responsibility. He was the past president for PSR as well. He's a retired primary care physician and health systems executive with an undergraduate degree in engineering from Columbia University and an MD from Brown University. He has a special interest in population health and the social determinants of health. He now writes and speaks on climate change and its impacts on health as well as about environmental justice. And last but not least, our uh, speaker would be, our last speaker would be Laveda Owens white um, She's also our, one of our board of directors. Uh, Ms. Owens white holds a master's degree as a clinical nurse specialist in germitolo ger ger gerontology. I, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that from the University of Delaware, uh, pardon my ignorance on that, and an undergraduate degree in nursing from Wilmington University. She's a member of the American Nurses Association, the Delaware Nurses Association, um, and she's also a board, board member of NAACP. After we have our presentations, we will uh, have around 15 minutes for our breakout um, room for small room discussions. So I hope you can stay till the end because those small group discussions, um, you know, they're, they're just um, so amazing um, intimate discussions. So hope you can stick around for that. Lisa. All right. Take it away. Okay, I trust you can see that. 
Um, let's see here. All right. So this is so interesting. I um, I and this this topic actually came up a while back when I was asked by the planners at the Youth Environmental Summit, which is an amazing initiative in their second year, how disappointing they had to do it online this year. But last year they brought together 250 high school students from around the state for a Youth Environmental Summit. Um, it was just fan fantastic. And so they did it again this year only online and they did an amazing job, it really was. Uh, but they asked me to <laughs> present this year on climate and COVID. And I thought, well, number one, what climate and COVID me? I mean, maybe the climate part, but uh, I started thinking about it and I got really intrigued with it. So um, I started researching and thinking and reflecting on this whole topic. And, you know, certainly one thing that just becomes clear to me all the time is how climate impacts and in, is impacted by every other social, cultural, political, environmental, scientific, health, economic issue. And, um, you know, so it get, it, it, and that whole comprehensive idea is so incredibly important, but it's also challenging. And then you add COVID into the mix. My goodness, that's, that's a tough thing to get your arms around. So anyway, I gave it a try thinking through this whole thing and um, trying to make sense of it for myself. And so I've come up with some ideas and I'm going to share and hope that they make some sense for you. Um, let's see here. So climate and COVID, these are kind of some of the questions that I'm gonna be looking at and I think all of us are gonna be looking at here tonight. So how did we get here? How are these crises connected? What impacts have we seen, both positive and negative? Who's being impact, impacted most? What lessons have we learned? And out of that, where does our hope lie? And what is required of us? And I'm going to be going through this and coming up challenging us with a kind of a revolutionary idea. So um, as uh, Shweta said, Dr. Alan Greenglass and Ms. Levada Owens-White will be offering a much more focused look at all of this, causes and impacts and connections between climate and COVID, but I'm just going to get you started out here with sort of a 101 assessment and some lessons I've learned in the process. So so climate change 101, of course, you know, what are the main causes for that? And most of you know, burning fossil fuels. You may not be aware of the incredibly important role that refrigerants plays. In fact, it's number one is in the greatest cause of um, greenhouse gases and climate change. Number one, the greenhouse effect in itself, deforestation, livestock farming, decrease snow and ice cover because then you have less area that's reflecting the solar rays away from the earth and just all of this um, getting our natural systems out of balance which just exaggerates everything. COVID, now this is much newer for all of us, the causes of this and it's a mutual encroachment kind of thing where increased temperatures from global warming have spurred the growth of bat friendly forest habitat in different places around the world, especially China, Central Africa, Central and South America. Extreme weather events have causing food um, shortages have increased then the, in the need for farmland development. So more of that development's been going on because of those extreme weather events. And then that includes encroachment on habitat population populated by monkeys and bats and other virus carrying animals that we weren't encroaching in their, their areas before. Um, so, and then this ongoing development expansion of urban areas, which my goodness, we're seeing around the state and certainly down here in Sussex County um, into farmlands and hunting grounds and into their forest habitats, again, exposing us to viruses that we hadn't been exposed to before and we're not immune to. And then there's the whole population density and increased trade and travel nationally and internationally that enables this virus to spread throughout the world so quickly.
Uh oh, there we go. Um, so, and then looking at positive and negatives and cross pollination between these two things. So, obviously, the negatives have just been overwhelming with disease and suffering and death, and both with climate, but certainly we've been seeing with the COVID. You know, this what is new for us this loneliness and isolation and re relationship strains and financial hard hardships in all areas. Um, all of these things that we are experiencing so directly and the schools and learning and social disruptions. And one thing that would, we would not have necessarily expected, but waste, my goodness, the increase in waste that we're producing, trying to keep ourselves safe, but this unintended consequence. Um, and then increased deforestation, extreme weather events, which, you know, think about this with all these with evacuations that are necessary because of that or cleanup and repair has become more difficult because of our risk of exposure. Um, and, you know, climate and COVID, we, I know most all of us have been so concerned to see the hit that, that scientists and science has been getting um, being converted into a partisan issue with cultural flashpoints and with our scientists being targets of conspiracy theories. But then there are some positives too. Again, things that we have seen with improved air and water quality, with our beaches being cleaner, again, the snow being more reflective because they don't have these coatings of dust and soot and particulate matters. Increased nature appreciation because we can't be together. We have been getting outside more and, and you know, feeding those needs that we have in communion with the natural world. Um, there's been a resurgence of wildlife as we've been retreating the wildlife has been coming back out again noise reduction i hadn't thought about it but people are especially in urban areas are talking about they're hearing the birds sing again this was interesting wild bees have been benefiting from enhanced ability to smell the flowers with the air quality whales have been able to communicate over greater distances again because of noise reductions and we have actually been finding time and money that we didn't have before through things like not driving. And because of this loneliness and isolation, we have increasingly found creative ways that we can communicate with each other and reconnecting with people that we haven't seen in a long time. And I'm sure you've seen some of these photographs, which are so profound of the difference in a short periods of time in less than a year, New Delhi, Venice, Milan, look at that between January and April of 2020. That's amazing. And when's the last time we saw Los Angeles looking like that? And the animals, look at this. This is not probably all good, but it's a little maybe fun. But look at these deer lying down in someone's yard in East London, coyotes wandering in San Francisco, these mountain goats coming down in Wales and wild boars. <laughs> taking over the streets in Haifa, Israel. Now this is, would be something good. Um, these rare turtles that have come back in Thailand. Uh, so I'm sure there's so many incidences of these kinds of things that these dramatic changes that have been happening in a short period of time. You know, again, bringing us back together, these faces um, of getting together in ways that we couldn't have done so easily before and uh, tapping into our shared humanity. So behind the scenes, there's been other feedback loops going on, positive and negative as well. Um, the COP26, you know, where the countries get together, um, where they had the Paris Climate Agreement, um, was unfortunately delayed a year because of COVID. Uh, there's been a number of international negotiations and environmental um, and climate programs delayed because of climate weakening climate policies with very often, unfortunately, maybe misguided reasons, um, thinking they have to be directing their resources and um, to other areas when they should, again, be thinking about this, how do we confront these things together? The EPA, I think, used as a, this as an excuse very often in turning back and weakening a lot of the regulations and exercising enforcement discretion uh, over the last year. 
And sadly, U.S. public health officials leaving their jobs after facing public abuse and threats of violence over COVID. And then positive. There has been some lowering of cost of clean energy and increasing research and development for green hydrogen, investing in more sustainable agriculture and forest management uh, practices. There have been incentives to decrease airline and shipping emissions. And Bill Gates, I believe, has been working on this and has this special kind of green fuel that he's using to get himself around the country and the world. France is aiming to become the main producer of electric vehicles. South Korea just introduced a new green deal. How about that? that would make it the first Asian country to commit to net zero by 2050. And the US, as you must all know, has joined the Paris Climate Agreement again. But we have to realize there is not time to tackle these two issues separately. And I found this really interesting article in Forbes magazine by Elizabeth Sawin, who we've done some research now. She's with Climate Interactive, which is a fascinating, site and initiative that we will share uh, links to that uh, with you, that you really should check it out. But she talks about creating a database of bright spots, because there are these bright spots around the world where places that are investing in COVID economic recovery funds in ways that increase equity and decarbonize the economy at the same time. This whole idea of multi-solving, not replicating projects as each site um, as each is site and culture and research resource specific, but replicating the attitudes and the approaches that make them a success. A focus on optimizing for many goals rather than maximizing for one. So we need, we need to be looking at these multi-solving networks, multidisciplinary approaches, you know, deepening our understandings um, in ways that are interconnected and aspirational. I just love these two quotes. I'm sure these two of your favorites as well as mine, um, environmentalists. So whether we or our politicians know it or not, nature is party to all our deals and decisions and she has more votes and a longer memory and a sterner sense of justice than we do. And from Rachel Carson, now I truly believe that we in this generation must come to terms with nature. And I think we are challenged as mankind has never been challenged before to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. Now we just too long and too easily underestimate the impact that we can have and both our profound capacity to harm and to heal. So what do we need to consider? Physics and biology, we tamper with them at our peril. I wonder how many of you remember the old commercial um, for the butter or margarine, it's not nice to fool mother nature. Um, human attitudes and behaviors. We have, again, such a profound capacity to harm or to heal. We can be our best friends or our worst enemies. We're certainly familiar with this whole idea of tribes right now, which is, you know, how are we defining ourselves and who are we aligning ourselves with and how is that either uniting or dividing us? Um, information, where are we getting it? Who are we trusting? Our decision makers, who are they? And what or who is influencing them? Well, that could be us. You know, so what inspires us? Finding out what it is that is going to inspire us to take those actions that need to be taken. Um, you know, and just that whole under, that whole idea of the inner, the web of life, which is not just a matter of survival, but it's a matter of quality of life and living and joyously. You know, so how many more decades is it going to take? COVID-19 is like, this also came from Elizabeth Sawin, is like an accelerated version of climate change, where we will move from recognizing the problem to acting on it to looking for lessons learned over a span of months rather than decades. You know, I was just looking up and I found this quote from Rachel Carson where she's referring to the climate change. And this is back in 1951. So that was 70 years ago. So what might the speeded up version 
of climate change teach us about dealing with existential threat that is growing so quickly? So what I've come up with, we need a revolution. And I, you know, I get nervous saying that really just because of the January 6th events, but what is a revolution really? It's a fundamental change in our way of thinking about or visualizing something. It's a change in us. It's a change of, paragraph, of paragraph, paradigm. So we, yes, we need to keep our feet planted firmly on the ground as we let our imagination soar. We need our understandings and our actions to match the magnitude of the problems we face. And we need to believe that anything and everything is possible and that we're the ones that can make it so. And in so many, we've got the tools that we need. We got, we do have so much of the understandings um, if we just educate ourselves and, and work on this together. So with that, uh, oh, here we go. We're gonna continue those thoughts but I'm right gonna now gonna turn it over to Dr. Greenglass. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was, that was really inspiring and wonderful. And we definitely need that revolutionary approach and multi-solving approach to really act on climate change. Um, and now we will like to invite Dr. Alan Greenglass. Well, th thank you for uh, inviting me tonight and, th and for inviting Leveda. Uh, I think that uh, we have a small group, so uh, if you people have questions, uh, there'll be time later on to ask those. I'm not going to show slides, uh, but if you want the outline of what I'm speaking about, or if you have specific questions that you don't get to ask, uh, or if you want references or resources about the information I'm going to provide, uh, let Schwetter know and I can get those to you directly. Uh, some of what I'm going to say, uh, Lisa has covered. Uh, some of it, you, there are people on the on the Zoom tonight who who may know more about it than these things than I do. Uh, so, uh, but I'll try to hit a middle spot between uh, uh, being very scientific and not being scientific at all. Uh, so I'm going to continue the theme that. Uh, Lisa started about lessons learned uh, about climate change and about uh, COVID. Uh, one is uh, COVID is not the first infectious disease risk that we are face, we faced uh, in, in the last century and in the last 10 years, and it won't be the last. So one lesson is uh, this is not an acute problem nor is climate change an acute problem that we're going to find the magic bullet and we'll never be bothered by them again. Uh, just think back uh, to 100 years ago, most people who died in this country died from tuberculosis or malaria. They didn't live long enough to have heart disease and cancer. That's a generalization, but that was the, the major causes of death uh, in the early 1900s uh, when maybe our grandparents or great-grandparents were alive, were infectious diseases. Uh, ironically, malaria and some other infectious diseases that we thought we'd wiped out, yellow fever, are now showing themselves in the Northern Hemisphere and Mexico and the Caribbean, as well as in the Southern parts of this country. So with climate change, we're starting to see those problems rear their heads again. But that's 100 years ago. Now, in the last 10 years or so, uh, Zika, Ebola, avian H1N1 flu, West Nile, uh, which we have in Delaware, uh, and now COVID, those are all diseases which are called zo zoonoses, which have jumped from the animal population to the human population. So once again, Zika, Ebola, H1N1, West Nile, and now COVID. So this is uh, a lesson learned is this has been happening. This is nothing new and it's not gonna go away automatically. Uh, 
as Lisa outlined earlier, habitat destruction is bringing some of these diseases closer to us, as well as climate change. So how do we get Zika? How do we get West Nile? How do we get uh, avian flu? Uh, they're insect-borne diseases, uh, how, many of which have jumped from the bat or other ma or mammalian populations to those insects and then to humans. Uh, something that we don't we not haven't mentioned yet tonight is tick-borne diseases. Uh, because of climate change, ticks are not dying off as frequently during during the winter. Their their season of reproduction is longer, so we're seeing more tick-borne diseases also, which is also a symptom of of climate change. So that that's one lesson. These things are happening and more of them are going to happen. Um, and we need to take action to prevent that. Uh, another lesson is that walls and national or state barrier borders can't protect our or any society. Uh, the way society is built now, we can't keep viruses and, uh, or bacteria or insects out. They don't read the map. They don't know they're not supposed to come from the Caribbean. Uh, in the bananas or in the ships that carry food to us or from China. They, they, can't, they don't know they're not supposed to come here. So that's a, another lesson, is that just by assuming that we have a barrier or a, a border isn't going to keep us safe. Likewise, when we talk about climate, uh, most of the soot pollution, also known as particulates, pollution in Delaware doesn't come from Delaware. It comes from Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, uh, Maryland, where coal is being burned in power plants for our electricity. Uh, one thing not to uh, forget is 60% of the electricity we have in Delaware comes from fossil fuel. Uh, most of that is being burned someplace else. Uh, 20% of our electricity, and this, these statistics come from Delmarva Electric, come from coal. So uh, once again, this, the lesson is, just as with viral illnesses, just as with mosquitoes, what these risks are ones that we can't keep out. We have to work with other people to, to decrease the risk. And some of those people are people in Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, so that they're not burning fossil fuels that provide our electricity. Uh, another lesson is economic and social conditions put some groups at an increased risk for both climate change related problems and for infectious COVID related problems. Uh, so what are those? Well, poor underlying health, okay? More obesity, more diabetes, more smoking, more asthma makes poor air quality and makes infectious agents such as COVID more dangerous to people with those risk factors. And unfortunately, uh, in Delaware and elsewhere, the risk of obesity, of diabetes, asthma, chronic lung disease is higher amongst the lower income inner city populations. Just the same people who uh, are at risk for COVID. A matter of fact, COVID and climate change, as Lisa said, are synergistic in, in, their risk, in the risks that they impose on the inner city populations. Uh, other risks in the, uh, that the inner cities, more people living closer together, more risk of passing the virus. Uh, substandard infrastructure due to inadequate investment in housing, access to healthy foods, food deserts, and in, inadequate uh, access to recreational facilities all contribute to asthma, uh, diabetes, obesity, uh, and the risk to both climate change and to COVID. Heat stress uh, caused by urban heat islands. Uh, it's been shown uh, and published recently that in our inner cities, the temperature may be five 
to 20 degrees Fahrenheit warmer in the summers than in their in suburban neighborhoods nearby. Uh, that's because of the blacktop, lack of trees. I, I see that there are a number of uh, master gardeners and, and master naturalists on, uh, on the Zoom tonight. Uh, I myself am a Delaware master gardener. Uh, so those folks know, uh, as well as people, Levada people living in the cities, the absence of parks, the absence of uh, tree, uh, uh, tree, treed lands, wooded, wooded land in our inner cities, all those contribute to that five to 20 degree hotter environment. And that puts people more at risk for asthma, chronic lung disease, heart disease, uh, and the risk of COVID, as well as the, uh, the morbidity mortality that comes from COVID. Uh, so that's uh, another issue, is the heat islands and lack of uh, good housing and uh, infrastructure in the cities. Uh, you know, something that, uh, that I think you know, people have touched on before is that lower income employment makes some groups more susceptible to exposure to heat and to unhealthy air. Uh, I had the privilege of not having to work outside uh, if I didn't want to during my life. That's not a privilege that many lower income workers have. Uh, I, I had most of us on the Zoom probably had the privilege of working or communicating via Zoom during the pandemic. That's not a privilege many people in the inner cities or lower income uh, communities have. So all those factors put people, certain groups of people more at risk to both the climate change issues, heat, poor air quality, as well as uh, the COVID risks. Uh, just a, a, a note about Delaware's air quality. This is something that any of us can track on a daily basis if we want uh, through airquality.gov or dot, uh, I believe it's .gov or .org. You can see what the air quality is today in your zip code in your county. Uh, unfortunately, Delaware's air quality is much better than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, part of that improvement is due to the regional greenhouse gas initiative that Delaware is part of. Uh, but it's Delaware's air quality is still some of the worst in the Northeast. And with hotter temperatures, uh, we'll see worsening air quality unless we do something positive about it. Uh, that air quality, poor air quality, both soot, all, which is also called particulate matter, and, and uh, smog, which is also called ground level ozone, contributes to asthma, chronic lung disease, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, as well as poor pregnancy outcomes. Uh, most people know that in Delaware, especially in Wilmington, we have some of the highest infant mortality rates in the country. Uh, and we also have some of the highest number of uh, poor air quality days in the Northeast in the Newcastle County, Wilmington area. A uh, couple more things before I stop and, and invite Levada to speak. Uh, one is, you know, how is COVID increasing the morbidity, morbid, the risk of being very sick and of dying from COVID? It's because both the, co the virus that causes COVID as well as, it, as well as soot or particulate matter affect the same parts of the lung and cause endothelial damage in the lung. And so that's where there's this synergy between poor air quality and the COVID virus. They both damage the lung at the same place. And working together, it's been shown uh, that uh, in communities where there is a even a 10% increase in the in the amount of soot in the air, there's a 15 to 20% higher risk of dying from COVID. So that's that's a correlation which has been shown in several studies uh, in in the United States and in other countries. A small increase in poor air quality in a community results in a 15 to 20% higher risk of dying from COVID 
it's been estimated in those studies that poor air quality is accountable for about 18% of the risk of death from COVID. So here's a, a lesson learned that as Lisa was saying, it's not just poor air quality, it's not just the virus working together, they, they make things worse. Uh, to kind of give some, uh, what do we do next? As Lisa said, uh, really it's going to take concerted, coordinated, collaborative and sustained uh, action to get to the, uh, to both, uh, and working at both adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation means dealing with the situation we have and trying to make it less deadly, less dangerous. So for example, for climate change uh, in the inner cities, it may mean cooling centers, right? That's mitigation. It's not, uh, that's, ad I'm sorry, adaptation. It's not, that's not going to make the air cooler, but it's going to make it less dangerous to people. John has told me that working with the churches in the community, you've, uh, you've been able to uh, set up cooling centers uh, in the past. That's not as, going to be as quite as easy as, uh, as uh, in, in the time of COVID and, and pandemic. But what, what some communities have done and what some, some physicians have done is they've provided air conditioning units to people who have asthma, people who, or to older people who are more vulnerable to the effects of bad, of bad air quality and of heat. So those are some, that, those are some of the, one of the example of adaptation. Um, mitigation means reducing the primary risk of that conditioning, condition occurring. And so that's things such as working to not burn coal to provide our electricity, working for community solar, uh, so that there's other options other than burning fossil fuel uh, for our electricity. Uh, it's moving towards uh, retrofitting houses and doing energy audits as uh, Interfaith Power and Light is doing, so that uh, in the inner cities, as well as in the suburbs, people can take advantage of having safer homes with fewer allergens and better uh, less mold, bit more air conditioning, et cetera. Uh, I think the last thing I want to mention is partnerships, not trying to do this al alone, just as they're master naturalists and gardeners on the, on the call, just as uh, uh, on previous Zooms, we've had state legislators. Uh, there are, don't try, let's not try to do this by ourselves. Forming coalitions is, is the more powerful way of making change and getting people to listen to us. Uh, uh, and maybe the last thing I want to mention is uh, not everybody gets the same message and gets the message in the same way. One thing you should talk about, we should talk about in our chats and together is you know, some people getting them scared works, some people it's listed, but to more people, it's listening to them. Why do, why do you not think climate change is important? Why do you not think what you do makes a difference? Why do you not think, why do you think that vaccination is not for you? Uh, what is it going to take for you to, you to be an advocate for vaccination, be an advocate for wearing masks? What is it about, what is it that speaks to you rather than a blanket message of climate change is bad, we're all gonna die. COVID is, gonna, is bad, and if you don't do something about it, we're all gonna die. What's the mess, what's going to resonate with that person you're talking to? Uh, talking to them as a friend, as a partner, and as a fellow community member, not as a, an adversary. Uh, so thank you, and you know, hopefully we'll get, have a lot of discussion and questions. Thank you, Dr. Ellen. That was that was fantastic. Um, and uh, without any further ado, I would like to invite Laveda. Laveda, please take the stage. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Lisa and Dr. Greengrass, for uh, those comments. Uh, certainly, uh, as we uh, try to think about 
how climate and COVID are interconnected. We know that uh, the corona pandemic has laid bare, has pulled the covers off the enormous inequities facing um, tens of millions of people in our society all across the country. But right, dealing right here in Delaware, we've looked at how school closures have highlighted how many children rely on free or reduced uh, price meals that they receive at, at, at school, how the closing of restaurants and other businesses have left workers who don't have paid sick, sick leave or any other savings struggling to feed their families and remain in their homes. Right now, there's about uh, statistics, I think from Kaiser Family Foundation talked about 44 million Americans don't have health insurance and up to 35 million Americans stand really close to losing their health insurance because of job loss. I've had friends uh, uh, around me who have had to take reduced pay and have uh, been, been, uh, been home for a number of days because they weren't able to go into work because their employers couldn't cover their pay. So we have a lot of things that discourage our communities from getting tested for the coronavirus or seeking a me medical attention at all. Uh, during this pandemic, we had folks afraid to go to their doctors or to the hospital because they were afraid of contracting the, the virus. So we're, we're learning as we live uh, how uh, these lessons that we've been talking about, how, how there are enormous cracks in our safety net systems, in our healthcare systems, in our economic system. So when we think about the uh, impact of, of uh, the virus upon the community, we have to look at um, how it has been broad affecting our economy, our culture, uh, politics and the environment, all, all, all these areas. That, and they have uh, impacted our communities of color most significant, significantly and it's been devastating. When I started my career back in 1964, I was involved uh, and my practice was mostly pe pe pediatrics. And now uh, my graduate degree is in gerontology. So I've gone uh, virtually uh, from the cradle to the grave in, in trying to um, uh, serve our community. As an advocate and community activist, uh, I'm mostly concerned with our community's health. And being a person of faith, I have blended the, that into a faith and health connection so uh, that I could address not only the physical aspects of our well-being, but also the, the, the mental and spiritual. As it's been said earlier, our communities of color face higher risks of experiencing the most serious of symptoms or dying due to COVID-19 because of the greater prevalence of underlying health conditions that Dr. Greenglass alluded to, diabetes, heart disease, asthma, and lung disease. The Kaiser Family Foundation uh, data shows that Black Americans and American yeah. Indians and Alaska Natives are more likely than white Americans to report pre-existing health concerns that would heighten their risks amid the co coronavirus pandemic. And I might remind you that we're facing more than a climate and, and, and coronavirus epidemic, but we're also facing a racial epidemic. According to uh, the uh, Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, we have to look at the disparities and, and a lot of our states are not reporting uh, on the um, race and ethnicity. 
So we have we're, we would like to see that uh, increase among our states so that we could have an accurate depiction of just how coronavirus is affecting our, our community. But from the data that we do have, Black people accounted for a higher share of confirmed cases in 20 of 31 state, states and deaths in 19 out of 24 states compared to the, the, the share of the total population. So what underlies these health disparities across demographics is people's overall economic well-being, which in the United States is uh, compared with race, race and ethnicity. Black, Latinx, American Indian, Alaska Native people are much more likely to report income below the poverty line. So those are the things that are impacting our community. Those are the things that we have to rely on. Just even getting transportation, we have to consider that. Just getting from one place, uh, particularly in the city and, and our rural communities, transportation is a problem. Getting to, to, to uh, access healthcare, getting to jobs, getting to um, the, uh, the uh, centers that we need to, uh, our state service centers where we can get financial help or assistance. So in mitigating the impact of disparities, um, we need to ask our, our national, state, and local leaders to pursue strategies to address both um, the immediate and longstanding health disparities and the inequities that are being experienced by communities of color. So the most, um, effective strategies that we could think of may not be limited to the uh, period of the immediate crisis. We need long-term planning that addresses uh, health equity and will uh, allow our, our public health department and our state officials to alleviate those economic and health impacts on the most vulnerable communities uh, as we begin to reopen and recover. And even then, uh, we see that as uh, uh, restrictions are lifted, that, that um, our cases are, are beginning to rise. We're not, we're not uh, following the guidelines to wear masks and to wash our hands and to social distance. It's like going back to the old normal and we're not understanding that we need to live in a new no normal. So we have to collect the, uh, our data to track and address disparities in COVID-19 um, related to testing and, and uh, even getting the vaccines out, uh, looking at our hospitalization rates, uh, how our, um, once you go into the hospital uh, and recover from, from uh, the virus, how is that different among racial and ethnic groups? How is uh, creating a, a, a health equity response team uh, going to affect us in the future? So as we had said earlier, or it was earlier said that partnering with communities of color through our um, political leaders, our community leaders and organizations and collaboratively addressing policies and programming and uh, sharing resources that are needed in, in the most hard hit communities. Those are the things that we need and we need to prioritize our communities of color when um, uh, distributing uh, the vaccines, when we allocate COVID testing sites. Uh, just because we have the vaccines now don't mean that uh, we should stop our focus on testing and uh, having uh, the treatments available, uh, addressing the barriers to testing and care. Right now um, in Wilmington, well, throughout the state, actually, there's a group of, uh, it's called the Co Community 
mobilizing groups that is trying to address um, uh, the disparities and, and address the barriers uh, to testing and the barriers to care um, of getting the vaccine. We're doing that uh, on the ground and making these partnerships viable. So uh, we have some, uh, I think the governor goes on the uh, television or TV daily uh, trying to uh, develop a recovery plan for Delaware and to help address some of the disproportionate economic and health impacts on our communities of color. We have now um, mobilized uh, uh, food vans so that we could address the food inequities that are in um, uh, the food deserts that um, are in our communities and because of the loss of jobs that some people, uh, their, their pantries are bare. So we're, look, we're getting um, the food bank to come out into the communities and distribute uh, food throughout the state. Our uh, emergency um, uh, financial, giving financial uh, care, the Delaware Relief Program, we're trying to address those issues as well. Those people that have lost uh, their jobs and are unable to afford uh, to pay their rent or pay their mortgage, that we're trying to address that and um, we're trying to ensure workplace protections for those essential workers and um, particularly in the grocery stores and other industries that employ many people of color and leaking, linking people of color to job training, those that have lost their jobs and can't go back to, to their former positions and other employment supports that are necessary. So it's really important that we raise awareness of uh, our situation and, and provide education, uh, both from those that are uh, the politics, those that uh, develop the policies and programs, and those of us on the ground that uh, are, are um, subject to those policies and, and, and uh, programs. So we're trying to educate our, our communities on the importance of uh, getting immunized, getting the vaccine. We know that immunization saves millions of lives and, and, and it's worldwide recognized as the most successful and cost-effective health intervention. We know that vaccines save up to 3 million lives each year worldwide from uh, the different infectious diseases. So uh, we're uh, trying to explain to those who have some vaccine hesitancy that vaccines are, are like giving your immune system all the answers you need to the test in advance of a, of a, of a study or having to be tested, that it allows your body to, to recognize the virus and, and, and have it protect you. So uh, our vaccination programs uh, throughout the state, we're trying to, as you may know, that Delaware um, uh, reductions in, in our death rates have been uh, decreased because people are willing to get vaccinated. And so today we rely on these vaccines to fight off these illnesses and, and protect our communities. The point of it is getting the vaccines to the community. As we know, we had, uh, we've got three different vaccines uh, that are fighting uh, to keep us protected, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and now Johnson & Johnson. And for most people in our community, there is there are lines waiting to receive these vaccines. They are lined up waiting, calls from months and months ago, where can I get this vaccine? And some have the preferences because they do have to go to work every day uh, or for the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine because there's that familiarity with the household name and it's only the one shot. So a lot of people are asking for that, but um, for the most pe uh, 
most point people are trying to get the first vaccine that is available to them. So our resources um, that we need to uh, educate our, our employers and our community, raising awareness about the benefits of, of the vaccination and trying to address the common questions and concerns. Uh, there's still a few people who are stuck on the Tuskegee um, incident, but we're overcoming that more and more as we have uh, people in, in the uh, National Institute of Health, people of color uh, in all aspects of the development of the vaccine or looking, keeping their eyes on the progress and the safety and the, um, uh, the safety of the vaccine that we could take more and more confidence. We see our black physicians coming out in the community, leaving those hospital halls to come out into the community to assure our community that they are being protected, that the vaccine is safe. So these uh, kind of practices ensure that the vaccines reach people, all the people, all the people who need them while attention to the appropriate administration of vaccines is uh, essential, it cannot be assumed that um, these, these uh, vaccines are reaching every person that is, that, that is needed or that wants to receive it. So in our uh, community and trying to bounce back from this epidemic, um, our response is now more than ever to build uh, 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 the community resilience. It's a time to leverage our networks and har harness our collective power to ensure the health and well-being and equitable access uh, to support our, our most vulnerable community, our children and our family. So uh, we're working uh, across all kinds of sectors. Uh, our community mobilization group here in Wilmington uh, have joined with the faith community in uh, reaching out to their congregations and joining, joining the public health in providing vaccination sites. Our, our, our pastors are preaching the word uh, and ensuring uh, that everyone who wants to receive, we're not trying to force anyone to to get the vaccine. We're trying to make sure that if you, if, if you want it, there's no barriers that will keep you from getting it. And so our pastors remind our, our uh, parishioners that um, the vaccine is safe. It's necessary uh, to protect our loved ones, ourselves and our loved ones. And, um, many of our religious and, and spiritual traditions are now poised to respond to the time of, of this crisis. And we've always, the churches always have been there since day, uh, the that time it was created to be a, a, a safe haven for those who are seeking care. So often in times of distress, we turn our minds to our higher power. And this, can be difficult if the places that we normally go to are closed or now are beginning to open. But certainly we have been trying to, uh, through our newsletters and bulletins, to encourage people to practice those spiritual uh, traditions at home, to uh, try to recreate whatever faith tradition that you have, try and recreate recreate that atmosphere at home. So uh, and a number of our houses of worship are posting their services online. So we're trying to get people to stay connected and um, offering this opportunity to, to our, our community. We have a mental health association, NAMI, uh, that's the National Alliance for Mental Illness in Delaware, have put online a lot of support uh, programs that uh, you could stay at home and, and get to. 
uh, and try to address the fact that of, of the digital divide with our, our, our seniors and some of our families and houses that don't have Wi-Fi. Uh, we're responding to that by trying to put up hot spots where people can access that in, in the time before the uh, kids could go back to school to continue their education, but mainly so many groups out in the community are trying to reach our, our, our families and uh, support one another as we go through this pandemic. So having said that, I would be glad to entertain any questions that you might have for me. Any questions? about how we are staying connected. Thank you. Thank you, Levita. That was great. Lisa, now we have um, a short amount of time left. Do you want to um, play that video? Or do you want to just go out in the breakout room for a discussion? I do see one question, which was, I think it was answered by uh, Dr. Allen. Shouldn't there be increased vaccination to all poor people, regardless of color? Yeah, and, and I did answer that in the chat. Uh, you know, the risk factors are not, just racial or ethnic, but to be practical, it's in our inner cities where you have this confluence of higher risk of kind of coming in touch with the vex with the virus, as well as uh, things that uh, such as poor air quality, uh, lack of air conditioning, uh, etc., which make the virus more dangerous. So. And our inner cities in Delaware and elsewhere are predominantly communities of color. So yes, it'd be great if everybody could get the vaccine, um, but in, to, to get the most bang for your buck, basically, let's get, let's get into those urban areas where Levada is trying to set up vaccine sites. Uh, and you know, she's reminded us that it's, yeah, there's some people who are reluctant to get the vaccine, but a lot of the issue is uh, no place to get it, and you know not enough doses and not enough people to provide to to give the vaccine, and you know those are those have to be tackled, and the the, the place where you get the most impact is going to be in those cities, which are as I said, predominantly communities of color. Society, civilizations, in some sense, are so your screen is not shared yet. Well, so are you talking to me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I guess it makes sense with the amount of time we have. A group discussion that is isn't going to be as valuable. So I am going to play a, a short video uh, called The Next System. And um, this is, it was launched in 2015. The Next System project is aimed at bold thinking and action to address systemic challenges the United States is facing. So I was talking about revolution. This kind of encapsulates that. And I think it brings a lot of these issues that we've been talking together in a very profound way. So um, I will play this for you now. Like our bodies, if there's something systemically wrong, it's manifesting all over the place um, in all our organs. And that seems to be what's going on in our world. The system is failing all around us. Our infrastructure is falling apart. Our jails are full and can't hold more people. Our young people are burdened with a trillion dollars in student debt. We're in a heap of trouble. When the temperature of the earth is starting to rise, 
that's a very bad sign. Our earth is running fever and it's running it because it's sick in many ways. In a country like the United States, the fact that anywhere from 45 to 50 million people are hungry, this is a problem. We can't go on like this. We can't keep moving toward climate catastrophe, nuclear war, persistence of inequality, poverty, famine. There is a systems problem. These are not one-off issues. They are interconnected, and we have to look at the system as a whole. It's time to talk about alternatives. It's time to talk about what's next. We need to be aspirational and be clear about the vision of the world that we want. What is the system that humanizes us? What is the system that opens up our imagination and possibilities of cooperation? Nothing is more important right now than to discuss how can we bring about this change. As systems fail, individual and community creativity explodes. And that's what we have seen. People in this country are solving the problems themselves. They're coming up with new models and strategies. And within those models and strategies are the kernels of a systemic way to move forward. Land trusts, cooperatively owned businesses, sustainable energy, state-owned banks, urban gardening, urban farming. These small successes taken together are a proof of concept that this can happen on a larger scale. We're compelled to search for alternatives, not just analytically, but in how we live and what we do, how we organize our daily lives. And that has tremendous potential. Our actions and our imagination have to match the magnitude of this problem. We have to get out of our comfort zone. We must think with courage. All bets are off in terms of our previous thinking, our ways of thinking about the economy and our ways of thinking about politics have proven an abject and utter failure. The good news is we have no choice but to adopt revolutionary thinking. I like that. That's the exciting part about this moment. When there are no rules, then people have freedom to invent and to create new things. I have no doubt that we can create a better America. If the people who cared about these things really join together to do something about them. Anything is possible. The biggest worry for me is that we don't try, is that we don't push for what we know is right, for what we know is possible. It's time for everybody who cares about this country and the future of the planet to do something about it, to get involved. We can actually do better. We can build a better system. It's not impossible. It's a very American thing to do to build a, a new system. It's a challenge. We can do it collectively, neighborhood by neighborhood, step by step. I think that the world that we're on the verge of is bright and beautiful and interesting, complex, local, interconnected. I hope we get there. It's time to talk about what's next. Please come and sign. Sure. Okay. Hey, that was, yeah, that was great. Um, now, um, we are only handful of us left. I don't think, do we need two rooms or should we stay in just one room? Oh yeah, I think we should stay together and, and just, you know, there's so much to talk about that it's hard, you know, how do, how do we, how can we close this effectively, you know, are there any, you know, things that really stand out for people? Um, how do we continue this conversation? Any thoughts from anyone? Hello, Reverend Archie. Hello, how are you? Hello, Reverend Archie. Very, very well. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be with you. Hi, Sherry. So it's kind of hard so what to leave you with, in, with this after all of that, but um, it gives us a lot of food for thought. Well, if, if I could just make one quick comment, I apologize. I had my video off. I 
<laughs> have a puppy who was misbehaving. So I didn't think you'd want to actually see me. Um, but um, I liked in, in that video, the neighborhood by neighborhood. And yeah, yeah. Um, we have a great opportunity to make a big difference in our um, low income, you know, underserved communities that are primarily people of color, as Veda pointed out. And, and there are lots of opportunities to make a difference. And um, I, that's where I would like to start. And they're exciting ones. They're positive and hopeful and fun things. Uh, but we need to be focused and committed and coordinated to meet the challenge. Well, I would like to add that um, on my end as a, as a district superintendent in the United Methodist Church, um, we're getting much more um, intentional about living out what we call our social principles. Um, and it covers so much of what we've talked about, um, obviously being transforming agents in the world. Um, and these two major topics are, are what we're trying to really lean into resources wise, human resources wise, finances, uh, that is being good stewards of, of God's creation and um, yeah, really uh, helping to uh, alleviate poverty, which includes the disease area and, and healthcare. You, you, everything is so very interrelated. And so um, we're making a push in our churches and we're getting some resistance uh, as, as we expect, uh, but it is our own social principles and we're trying to live into it. And so my hope is that um, I can um, work with people in, in the wider community as well as the, the United Methodist Church in Delaware and the Eastern Shore of Maryland to make it a major focus of our, of our ministry. That's wonderful. And just those kinds of processes of when you can bring people together that don't have exactly the same perspectives, but finding those places of common ground, which they are there. You know, everyone wants a healthy environment. Everyone wants healthy air to breathe and water to drink and a good place for their children. So. Amen. And as Dr. Ellen mentioned, you know, we can't solve this alone. So collaboration is the key, you know, common ground where all of us are working together, whether our, you know, it's healthcare workers or pastors or you know, faith leaders, um, environmental organizations, we all kind of have to come together and have that multi-solving approach because climate change, you know, cannot be solved alone. And when we are thinking about it, how can we more be more inclusive about all the problems that Leveda talked about? You know, these are systemic changes that we have to make. So when we are building again, how can we build better and think about what we, you know, how can we start in a way which is more inclusive where we can actually take care of people who were left alone before and bring everybody together and, you know, building a better environment for all of us, you know, thinking about those collaborative approaches. In my mission to try to connect, uh, make that health and faith connection, it seemed long time ago when um, medicine was was uh, uh, created, the hospital systems, that our religious groups kind of abandoned the the um, spiritual the, their their physical space to medicine rather than us working together. And now it's so hard to get uh, our public, uh, our politicians to see the role of the faith community uh, and the connection between faith and health and getting our pastors to preach that me message that we are, uh, if you don't address the, the problems of, of the body, the mind and the spirit, 
then we are not completely whole. We are in, we we are subject to being ill in one part or another. But we have to bring these elements together in order to to be a whole person and have our well-being uh, and spirituality so, uh, uh, attributed to, to our overall uh, physical, mental, and spiritual health. So in trying to connect the dots that we have, it's bringing uh, and uh, having our politicians recognize the role of the faith community into the health arena. Mm -hmm. I, I was listening to a, uh, 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 a meeting uh, earlier today uh, with the White House uh, uh, Environmental Justice uh, uh, Action uh, Council, uh, our advisory council, and one of the things that they talked about was a strong connection with the faith-based community. Uh, on that, and I, I think we have seen in places like Wilmington where that can make a difference when it's targeted. You know, we look at places like West Center City uh, uh, up in the Northeast uh, as well, and where there is a strong faith community, uh, there is a larger community that does make a difference. And uh, I, the collaboration that, that Alan talked about, uh, I think is, is important uh, a whole lot one of the things that Alan had uh, mentioned that a uh, takeaway for me, and I, I kind of knew a little bit about it, was that when you look at, at some of the uh, uh, similarities of, of uh, COVID and, and uh, uh, climate, he referred to lung uh, issues, uh, where there is such a big difference, where uh, if you have poor air quality, that COVID just uh, jumps in real, real strong. And it would seem like targeting block by block ways that we might be able to impact air quality uh, uh, would be a place to do that uh, uh, as well. We're not gonna fix everything, but if we can just uh, work with, with the government and to try to, to uh, uh, put policies in place that are going to make a difference in, in a couple of areas like that, that perhaps it will make life uh, better for people in those areas, and then that will spread as well. Just imagine just increasing green space in the urban areas. All of the impacts of that, of it can create a cooling of the neighborhood, it can be purifying the air, it can be help of purifying the water. If you have the right kind of plants, you can be having food production. It creates a uh, it, there's even been studies that show that it can decrease crime rates and increase, you know, feeling of well-being. That's just, I love that example of, uh, mm -hmm. and using faith communities as anchors, you know, for, for those initiatives is what we're looking at right now with Sacred Grounds. Yes, yes. Yeah. And we have, we have a, a community air monitoring network. So when people come outside the church walls, and start joining these groups and uh, creating uh, the opportunities for their members to get involved. It's one thing to, to try to get to heaven, but it's another thing to try and improve the place where you live right now. Right. You just, just to, that's, that's a great point. Uh, and you know, I, I think there are, immediate actions. You know, I'm a big believer in green space. That takes time. Uh, you know, if you plant a tree today, it really doesn't start sucking up carbon dioxide for five to seven years, depending upon how fast it's growing. I mean, it sucks up a little bit, but not, not enough. But, you know, here's a couple of things. You know, I mentioned that Delmarva burns coal for 20% of our electricity. Uh, so where can pressure be applied to stop that? Many, uh, many states uh, are putting pressure on their utilities to close down their coal powered plants. What's Del Marva's plan? I believe we still burn coal 
at Indian Point downstate. So it's not all coming from elsewhere. Some of it's coming from our own state. So what, how, what pressure can be applied legislatively uh, by our communities in partnership with each other to change that? That's one example. Here's yeah, another example. I don't know if there's a bill that we might support, or uh, you know, some some legislator has proposed something that we might. Well, there's champion. community solar, for example, uh, which is looking for a substitute for coal and other fossil fuels. But here's another example. Another big source of soot are the diesel buses, which are running through our communities. Right. And which communities do, do most of them run through? Yes, we have school buses throughout the state, but the inner city transit. Now, we need the inner city transit, right? But why do we have diesel buses when we could have hybrid buses or electric buses? Right. And that, that action in its own right would clean up the air in, the, in our inner cities. Yeah. Another example, as we I talked about earlier, is access to air conditioning. In some states, the Medicaid plans pay for air conditioning for people who have asthma or chronic lung disease. That is a standard which is set by the state. The state determines what benefits Medicaid can and should provide in, its, in the community. If we have a problem with asthma, problem with infant mortality, problem with heart disease, problem with COVID in our inner cities, how do we clean up the air most quickly? Well, air conditioning, conditioners bring down the temperature and filter out impurities from the air. Taking the diesel buses off the street, decrease the help, decrease the heat in the community, decrease the air, the, improve the air uh, quality. So those are some examples of, on a high level, stop burning coal on a, what can we do really quickly in the communities in our communities, take away the buses, uh, get air conditioning. In some states, actually, uh, the state Medicaid or health systems are building new housing, higher quality housing. That's happening here also, uh, Dr. Greenglass. We have, um, we're working on the legislation with renewable portfolio standards uh, where the Sierra Club's involved, the Community Air Monitoring Network uh, is involved, Interfaith Power and Lights, we're involved. We're doing uh, many of the things that you're suggesting, including the transit equity uh, piece. So it means though that we need to beat the grasses, the bushes for more people to get involved, to raise awareness. As I stated in my presentation that we need uh, more education to raise awareness and educate the public about the, the what we can do, uh, why we need to do it. Those are the things that I think we can do most immediately to raise awareness and educate our population. There's also an opportunity coming up with the Newcastle County Comprehensive Plan. Um, the county is actually going to hold a workshop on social justice and environmental justice in May. And I can get the information to everybody. We are absolutely thrilled. The community really pushed for this. Um, Councilman Carter, you know, had a, an ordinance adopted and the staff kept telling us, well, you know, just because it's an element in the plan doesn't mean we have to have a, a different section or have a workshop and we kept pushing and everybody else did. And here we go, we're gonna have one. So we need to show up and tell them what they need to include in the plan that will make a difference oh. to start addressing. That, that's and great. Sherry, you share that information and you know we, we, can, we can share it with everybody um, here and we can also put it in our newsletter. That'll be great. Uh, it is past 7.30, so I think it's uh, it's time to end this discussion. Thank you so much for everyone for joining. Thank you for all our, thank you to all our presenters, uh, Leveda, Dr. Allen, Lisa, and thanks for everyone for joining us. Please stay tuned and, you know, for our uh, next month, uh, for, for the entire uh, Earth Month, we have a lot of different 
events planned. So stay tuned, follow us on our Facebook page and we will keep you updated. But, but let's work together on, on, on climate change. Together we can solve this. Together we can make um, a lot of good improvements. So thank you so much again. Have a good night.